Alrighty, guys, welcome back. We've got our final panel of the day. Um, and I'm sitting here with Roger Christian, who um, I, I think for a long time, it kind of uh, your work went uh, underappreciated. Uh, and, and, and it seems like more recently, uh, we're finding out more and more about the work you did. Um, for those who, who don't know, I'll let Roger talk about himself a little bit more, but uh, Roger won the Oscar in, uh, for set decoration on Star Wars, along with the, the team you worked with. Uh, and he was really responsible for not just creating that lived-in universe that we're all so familiar with, uh, but then populating it with the, the vehicles, the props, uh, and even the droids that, that lived there, and is really responsible for that, that look we all know in Star Wars. Um, I was speaking with Roger before, and I think uh, we are talking about that we're all pretty hardcore Star Wars fans here. Uh, but even as a kid, I think Star Wars was one of those things where uh, what really drew myself and a lot of people I know to it was the universe. It wasn't just the characters. It wasn't just, I want to be Luke Skywalker or I want to be Han Solo. It's, I would love to go live in that space for a little bit. I'd love to go to that cantina or drive a land speeder or, uh, you know, have a Wookiee co-pilot. Uh, it wasn't just about, uh, it was more of an open thing where you could picture yourself in there. Uh, you knew it was a universe from which like a million stories could come out of. Uh, and I think a lot of that's thanks to Roger and, and George, of course, as well. Uh, so we're really honored and, and, uh, lucky to have you here today. So thank you very Not much. At all. It's good to be here. <laughs> So uh, let's rewind way back to, um, I guess, what would it have been, 1975 Five. that you first met George Lucas? How did, uh, how did he first ap approach you? Um, I'll compress it. The, Alan Ladd hired George Lucas because they all wanted to revive the studios because they were all suffering. Yep. He came in with his... Alan Ladd's worst nightmare, which was a science fiction <laughs> fantasy story for children that there was no marketplace for at the time. Yeah. So the Fox board um, estimated the film would gross $12 million. <laughs> and in those days, they divided it by three. So they said to George, if you can make your film, you can do it for $4 million, yep. we'll make it. Gary Kurtz's budget was at $8 million in America, which is still nothing. <laughs> but, and that was based on them doing T THX, yeah. doing it for real. Mm -hmm. um, and it just coincided with UK was exactly half the cost of America at the time. We had a lot of stages free because yeah. people were not making films so much there. And um, I was working with John Barry, the designer, on this huge film, uh, Lucky Lady in Mexico, but we were adapting old Mexican buildings mm -hmm. into rum-running buildings from the 20s, 30s. That was written by Gloria and Willard Hike, who wrote American Graffiti oh, okay. and were friends know. of George's. And yeah. John Barry and I had become great friends. They were wonderful, Gloria and Willard. So they said to George, listen, you should fly down and meet them because they're doing what you want. They're <laughs> doing a spaghetti Western, but as a 2030s movie. Yeah. And so George flew down with Gary. I was set dressing, uh, set decorating a salt factory. There was a whole action scene in the where they had Salt was a big commodity then. And George arrived in the plaid shirt, <laughs> jeans, and we were all like students. And he came across. He actually grabbed a shovel and helped me shovel. Yeah. And he said, I want to make the science fiction film. And kind of I just instinctively said, you know, I didn't really like Flash Gordon very much, the look of it. I didn't like any science fiction films. I said, they're not real. And my idea is an old car in a garage and it's dripping oil and it's being yeah. repaired. I only realized later when I read the script, I'd exactly described <laughs> the Millennium Falcon. You said the perfect thing to him? Yeah. <laughs> and um, so that was it. Uh, John Barry was number one hired. Jeffrey Unsworth, the DP, who in the end couldn't do it. And I was number three hired on the film. Mm -hmm. And we were just told to be in London on August the 1st to start work. And, and like, did you trust George to? I yeah, guess? because I'd seen THX. I was really impressed by it. To me, this was real science fiction. Oh, okay. and, so and you were it, on board right from the beginning. Yeah, and yeah. he did it with 
no money mm, and yeah. um and he'd made american graffiti which is just it's a great movie yeah. i i thought this guy is really good and george never said much especially in those days um when we got to london we didn't know the budget we just know what it was we had a meeting in 20th century fox and where it was announced the budget was 4 million dollars <laughs> yeah gary kurtz was still trying to get it down to that and um John Barry and I went, George paid us. Fox weren't in. They wouldn't give us any money for four months. Jo really? George paid us. So George us. was really out of his pocket funding yeah, that initial work. John Barry, myself, and Les Dilly, one art director, were based in a tiny studios in London. And um, <laughs> I did my breakdowns and I looked at John. I said, I, I can't make this. <laughs> I think I had $200,000 for this huge film. And... Um, but me being me, I thought, right, I'm going to find a way around this because I'm going to make this film. And the first thing, and in a way it led to how the whole thing looked, because George always, I mean, my mentor was Kurosawa. Yeah. So I love Kurosawa. And every time you mention spaghetti westerns, every spaghetti western Leone did is based on a Kurosawa movie. Okay. Same yeah. story. So um, I kind of thought, okay, I'll, I know what I'll do. I went to a gun hire place that they were friends of mine and that's where you hired for any movie in Britain. Yeah. And I got a um, Sterling submachine gun because I loved them and I thought, this is science fiction, I could just use this. But I stuck T-strip around it, got super glue, stuck some sights I found in there. He kept saying that uh, Han Solo was a, a cowboy, basically. Yeah. And I found this Mauser in there that I thought, well, that's a sci-fi gun. Look at it. Stuck the sights on the top mm -hmm. and made a call to John Barry and said, you better bring George here because I hadn't told anyone what I was doing. Yeah. And that was the point. I, th I thought I'll be fired or I'll be hired. <laughs> <laughs> so. and, and for visual reference at that point, like, did you have any, were the, the Ralph McQuarrie uh, yeah. paintings? But yeah. that would be about, and then descriptions from the script and that would be it? Yeah, there was the script and um, there were six Ralph McQuarrie paintings that came. And oh, in fact, so Ralph's them. genius. And when, when this eventually yeah. comes out, the Galaxy Build on Hope, the documentary properly, which I think you've seen it. Yes, yeah. Um, I give back credence to Ralph McQuarrie because I think he's the forgotten hero of this and He's in those six paintings with Star Wars, everything, C-3PO, R2-D2, Chewbacca, the mm -hmm. Tunisia, Tatooine. I mean, everything yeah. is in there. And such a unique look from everything that had gone before. Yeah, he's a genius. You know, and Ralph, no one knows, but he used to work for Boeing. He, oh, he drew right. jet engines and things. So oh, okay. his things worked, you know, you could believe it. But um, at the same time, well, George appeared. I didn't get fired, and he <laughs> stayed with me. And we made Princess Leia's gun together. He he got yeah. his fingers burnt like mine with super glue. <laughs> just like sitting at the table yeah. with a bunch of parts and yeah. stuff. Uh, no, I just just went round finding, and I found a a, a a practice pistol. And I said, "This looks pretty interesting with a long barrel." And mm -hmm. then he helped me go through, and we found a piece for the end of it, and we did it like that. Wow, the yeah. entire Star Wars is made like that. <laughs> um, at the same time. John Barry and Les and I said, if he doesn't have R2-D2 working, there isn't a movie. They're not going to green light it because there was no CGI then. There was yeah. very primitive um, radio control. Yeah. So... Well, was the from the beginning, did you know you were going to be putting a person inside R2? There was the only way. Of, yeah. yeah. Our reference was Daleks. Okay, yeah. See, in Daleks, I don't know if anyone knows here Daleks from um, Doctor Who, they had a toilet plunger on the <laughs> yes, nose. Yeah. That you, <laughs> you, you, and they could be foiled by <laughs> stairs, yeah. basically. But everyone <laughs> believed them. Yeah, yeah. They were always like scared when they came <laughs> yeah, on. Yeah. So we thought, okay, that's the only way to do it. And we hounded George and eventually hired Kenny Baker, who was a comedian. He had his own mm -hmm. little comedy show and he was strong. Yeah. Because we knew this was not going to be an easy job. So how did you start making R2? Well, we went to Robert Watts, the line producer, and said, I haven't got any money. There's nothing. So 
I hired Bill Harmon, who made the props for Monty Python, who really had no money. <laughs> they had so little money, they couldn't even have horses on, <laughs> yes, on yeah. Holy Grail. And they, they can only afford coconuts. They use coconuts. <laughs> He's here. I filmed them, the coconut, <laughs> the actual ones. Yeah, um, yeah. He had some wood at home in the garage. So we managed to... It was marine ply, so he could bend it round. And then he said, Rog, I can't make a top. I can't do that. So yeah, the dome. I, I scrounged yeah. in the uh, in a lamp scrapyard <laughs> and found a top that matched exactly. So I, I went back to Bill and I said, if I go and ask for this, they're going to charge me quite a few pounds. So yeah. you go. <laughs> and he got it for 10 shillings and sixpence, he said. <laughs> so... And that fitted. And then he said, I can't do the little hands on the front. I carved those at home with a mm -hmm. pen knife. He gave me a knife. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those. Yeah. those I made those at home that night. And I'd got little pieces from a, a junkyard, which were the, these were the lights off an old Dakota aeroplane. I didn't know what it was. I just yeah. found shapes that I cool. liked and filters and things. And they're still there. I mean, that was R2-D2. Mm -hmm. And Kenny couldn't move it <laughs> yeah so we like in the actual wood one in this one oh, and wow. then so i asked him to bring his boots in and we stapled the boots in the bottom of his legs <laughs> yeah and he could wobble it but he still couldn't move it and i bought a fighter pilot's harness mm -hmm. in the junk that i bought yeah and bill stapled it inside and he could wear it like a rucksack <laughs> and he did three steps before he fell over <laughs> oh, but it's the most auspicious moment on Star Wars. As George mm -hmm. was there because we knew he had a movie. Yeah. The, 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 you'd kind of it conquered never the hardest task. Yeah, it never conquered. worked. The radio control <laughs> ones. And before we went to Tunisia, I'm jumping forward, but yeah. as we're on R2-D2, John Barry called me into the office and said, listen, I don't believe John Steers. I don't believe it's going to work. You're going to be miles out in the desert. Make a lightweight one out of fiberglass yeah. that you can pull on fishing wire. Okay, yeah. And the first shot we ever did was R2-D2 with the Aunt Beru and uh, Uncle Owen buying the robots. Yes, yeah. He came, crashed over, banged <laughs> another one. It Nothing. George went cut. Gary Kurtz said, where's the monofilament one? Mm -hmm. He was the only one who knew. And Les yeah. Dilly, who's with me, who's English, very English art director, said, what's monofilament? <laughs> <laughs> so I said, fishing wire. And from then on, the three-legged version, nearly all of it, we put a board down, put sand on the edge of it so you yes. wouldn't see it, and we pulled them along on fishing wire. So how many R2, R2s did you have for filming? For There was the Kenny Baker one. The two-legged, yeah. The three-legged one. The three-legged one we built, and a few, and one that they'd converted for the one that went wrong that Uncle Owen, which is part of the plot. Yeah, okay, the R5. I mean, that, <laughs> they set that up to do the shot. Um, and there was all this kind of hanging their heads in the uh, special effects department. And, and we looked inside mm -hmm. and Kenny couldn't get in it. <laughs> and it was filled with um, electronic radio control equipment. Yeah. And it didn't work. And they'd forgotten to put the... Um, the explosions of cinema. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. So we quickly got our one, repainted it, stuck a different top on it, and we oh, pulled wow. it along. And that's how that went. This is a, a kind of little potted version of how Star Wars <laughs> was made. But um, <clears throat> it, it kind of developed from the moment whereby I got all those guns ready. I mean, I, it, it, Ralph McQuarrie had actually painted a... Uh, a blaster in C-3PO's hands. Oh, really? Okay. And I'd found the bowcaster with the balls on the end, and I yeah. thought, this is far more suitable for a, a, <laughs> a, a seven-foot yeah. Wookiee. So I took to George, and uh, he changed the script for that one. Oh, that's great, yeah. And then I was driving around London thinking, how am I going to do this film? What am I going to do to make the Millennium Falcon? Because I knew this was coming up. Yeah, and pretty pivotal part of the movie. <laughs> yeah, so... I kind of thought I'd been in a submarine and I'd seen uh, Dr. Strangelove, the B-52 bombers. Yeah. And I thought, you know what, if I buy airplane junk, I could strip it down and make the sets out of it. Mm -hmm. And I had to go to John Barry and George and Gary and kind of own up and say, look, I can't afford to make anything. We don't have time. Mm -hmm. I've got an idea. 
only because George had made THX and because he's an independent filmmaker, he yeah. said, go and try it. <laughs> and, so, he, and I think he trusted you to, by at that then, point. Yeah, because yeah. I'd made a lot of the guns by then. We got yeah. R2D working. We we got, we designed C-3PO's head. Um, we, we had a brilliant sculptress doing those. And we started with 12 heads in clay. Okay. And it came down to two mm -hmm. and then down to one, and it didn't work. He had the Ralph Macquarie eyes, which were very small. Yes. And we're all looking at it, and um, Bill Harmon, the carpenter, they they always bought sausage sandwiches in the morning okay. <laughs> and tea. So there were two old English pennies mm -hmm. on the counter, and George picked them up and stuck them in his eyelids and yeah. there he was there was c3p on the clay model that's where it comes yeah. from yeah they're exactly the size of pennies oh wow <laughs> <laughs> so um it it kind of got into the studio then they finally said they would back it right before christmas and we started work in january the 6th and we were shooting in mid-march in Tunisia, or yeah. had you already started shooting in, in London? John Barry's genius. He designed um, The Little Prince for Stanley Donan, mm -hmm. a new Tunisia. And again, the, the same thing. How can we make Tatooine real and no one will question it? So yeah. there it was, Tunisia. Really, all I had to do was dress it, stick panels that we made in the walls, yeah. put the moisturizers in every set. We had about two that we moved around. Mm -hmm. And... Um, we kind of made it work there with a few extra domes on the top. Mm -hmm. um, and Les and I were sent down there. There is, I was showing here, when they go into the cantina, yeah. there's a crash spaceship. Yes. So <laughs> this came about because there's an olive tree in that set. Oh, really? And we said, this is a farmer's life. We cannot <laughs> take it down. They're very poor. Yeah. So John Barry had this idea, well, we'll just do a Boeing 747 size spaceship. Mm -hmm. They thought I was nuts. I was taking <laughs> down scrap in trucks down to Tunisia because yeah. there was nothing there that we could use. Well, so how long were you in London basically creating things that would be packed up and shipped down to Tunisia? <laughs> Month and a half, two months. Oh, right. So you didn't have a lot of time no. to and to create that many things when you think about all the weapons. Yeah, three uh, PO, R two, um, and the atmosphere was horrible. And I I tell this story happily now. And George is now being more open about it because nobody in the art departments or any of the crews understood what we were doing. They thought it was a pile of crap. And really, American culture then was pretty much in the toilet. It was mm -hmm. just Western. So anything American coming in was kind of looked down on. Okay. And um, in fact, the day, second day when we went to the studios, they had me lay out all the weapons we'd made, George and I, and everything was put on there. Yeah. And they came down, this whole group of supercilious <laughs> Britons, yeah. threw the stormtroopers blaster at me and said, this is absolute crap. You know, we're making a big science fiction film for a yeah. Hollywood director and went off to get me fired. And it kind of, uh, we'd become friends with George by then and I was doing my dream job. I mean, you mm. can imagine, even though I had no yeah. money, I didn't care and we were going to make it. So we just stuck together and mm -hmm. got it done. And Tunisia was amazing to be there. Very, very difficult. And mm -hmm. the storm on the fourth day brought everything down and we had to rebuild it. Everything. Yeah, so I, I remember hearing about that. Basically, I guess you guys had gotten there and had you hadn't started filming yet, but you no, started we were setting building, up all the sets. We were there building the, the huge sand crawler. That was the okay. biggest set we built. Yep. And you, you built kind of the first 25% of it, yeah. right? Yeah. And um, that their shots, which are salt flats, so basically, mm -hmm. when it rained like that, yeah. no one could walk. It was just mud. like, mm -hmm. And it dried in two days. It's so uh, dry down there. But we had to stop shooting and wait for that. Mm -hmm. That's a funny story there of um, yeah. the um, building the this sand crawl. It was still huge. Mm -hmm. um, is it is it wood or what is it? It was wood and slats and um, pieces of... But all built, yeah, on, on 
um, tubing, okay. scaffolding. And had you brought those pieces from Yeah, everything London? had to come. This yeah. was the pressure because yeah. we were to shoot the end of March. Everything took six weeks to get there in trucks across wow. all these different countries. So John Barry's genius. He would design pieces that fitted in other pieces. pieces. Oh, so it's like a Tetris of... Uh, yeah, it was yeah. like a... Yeah, it was a Tetris packing in there. So everything yeah. and then... As I said, I was bringing junk, which they thought I was nuts, <laughs> but I knew I needed it. There's nothing I could do. Yeah. The, the, we were on Tazer right on the Algerian border. I went there. It's just a ditch and a barbed wire. Yeah. Um, a huge army convoy arrived. And thank God Robert Watts, the line producer, spoke. He's fluent French. Oh, okay. Good. <laughs> they arrived. Um, accusing us of building a war weapon, <laughs> which was slightly true, but yeah, but well, not it had in a real sense. Wars, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they because we found out the oil fields ran under the border between Tunisia, and they thought we, oh. they, Tunisians were building a machine that was a war machine. <laughs> they were going to go to war and get the oil. Took a lot of convincing, but <laughs> because they didn't know what a movie was, they, yeah, they had no idea. But uh, we got it done, mm -hmm. and. Um, like what? What would be the size of the crew that was down in Tunisia? I, I would know. say it's ninety people. Oh wow! So that you must have been a um, well stuck out like a sore thumb, but like that's a lot of people to bring into. You were going into yeah. fairly small town areas and that sort of thing. Where did you guys actually stay? And and well, and, we uh, were supposed to stay in Tozer, but uh, Zeffirelli was down doing the Jesus, his Jesus of Nazareth series. So they okay. took all the hotel rooms because they had money. We didn't have money. <laughs> so we had to stay in a place called Nefto. It was fairly rough, but that's yeah. okay. And it was a two and a half hour, two, two and a half mile drive from there into where we built Luke's homestead and, and the mm -hmm. sand crawler. All of that was in one area. Yeah. And um, it's another funny story, but... Um, that first morning, because the special effects, John Steers, he, he's he's a genius. He was very good, but he was too full of himself saying, oh, it's going to be work. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> the first, when R2-D2 crashed on the first shot, he went in yeah. front of the crew and said, it's the taxis. They're upsetting my airwaves. <laughs> there was donkeys. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there was two old cars with carts in in. Tozer, which yeah. was a long way away. So um, it, it kind of, it, George always says he got about 25% of what he actually went to go and film. But yeah. he's such a precise editor that he knew exactly which piece he could use. And in fact, if you watch the film, knowing what I'm saying, mm -hmm. if you watch that scene with Uncle Owen and, and uh, Luke and R2-D2, R2-D2's hardly in it. But it's all about him. Yes, yeah. Because he didn't work. <laughs> That's why. If you watch carefully, you'll see what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, the, like when you mention it, and I think of the actual shots. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. Not, he's not much in it. Just enough static, enough like, to establish him. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, I guess one of the most. Uh, we'll actually probably go back to the Bloody Falcon there, but one of the most. Uh, iconic for me uh, vehicles is the land speeder and um, uh, that went through a couple of iterations right how was well, that, that to build that also we started in Lee Studios because yeah. we knew this was never going to work yeah so you wouldn't we be able to make it, it down there. yeah and so we got Bill Harmon he brought in wood from home and he bought some polystyrene mm -hmm. um, and we built one to John Barry's specifications, because when he read the script, there was R two D two, C three PO, yeah. Obi Wan Kenobi, Luke, yeah, a four seater, yeah. yeah no, so he built nice a four sedan. seater, and yeah. then George came and said, "No, no, he would have an old two seater battered little sports car." So mm -hmm. we, and to make it look right, Bill had wheelbarrow at home, and he yeah. he got three of the wheelbarrow wheels, and we stuck those <laughs> on it, and we got it down to the right size. Um, and again, it sums up Star Wars. Gary Kurtz's wife was there that day. She'd come to visit. They took it for a test drive yeah. because um, the special effects boys had given us an old Volkswagen chassis. Okay. And Bill Harmon, they cut off the front and put a motorcycle 
wheel and bars on the front and mm -hmm. welded it together <laughs> so it would give an idea of what we were trying to do. They drove it up this alleyway and yeah. it crashed. The wing fell off and everything. <laughs> and Gary Kurtz, his wife, said, this ain't Hollywood, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but it worked, you know. It was a way to do it. And then in the studios, I, I had actually seen these little tiny sports cars called Ogle that were tiny, beautiful cars on yeah. the road. They were near the studio. And because there wasn't time to do it, um, they farmed it out to them. They used the Reliant Robin, which is a three-wheeler, which is famous yeah. from Mr. Bean. Yeah, yeah. And they cut it off the top. And in fact, if you look inside the dashboard of the Land Speeder, yeah. it's the same as the Reliant Robin. We didn't change it. <laughs> it had the same steering wheel. I just stuck bits on it. Oh, that's and cool. um, we tried a hovercraft. That oh, didn't really? Work. Like yeah, you can't, yeah we tried yeah. it. Wow. thought, how are we going to make this work? And so they, there was rotoscoping at the time, and George felt he could probably rotoscope out the wheels. So well, what exactly does that mean for... All it's the same as animation that you go in and hand paint the frame okay. of film. Yeah. Um, but I, I had an idea and I suggested, why don't we hang a mirror at 45 degrees mm -hmm. under it and it'll reflect the desert. And in the distance, when you're looking out, at, always on those heat and the shots, there's yeah. always a mirage. Yeah, And I got an old brush from one of the um, Tunisians and we hung that on the front, fastened it, so it kicked a bit of dust and it actually worked. Amazingly well, yeah. 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 He's, he's rotoscoped afterwards, he's done more. And then for mm -hmm. it to land, they built a massive long tube on a stand and it was anchored onto it, the land speeder. So mm -hmm. every time it's in close-up landing, it would float. So and that's why when, like, when you see guys, people getting in and out of it, it's it, usually kind of yeah. cut off. The, yeah, it's uh, cut you off. don't see the full, <laughs> no, the full yeah, land speeder, no, but, yeah, no. but it gives that effect of yeah. it actually floating. And yeah. Cool. And so did you have two bodies? Like yes. that was a completely separate yeah. one from yes. that one. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing the amount of stuff you guys created in that short amount of time to not just do yeah. all of it, but to do two of them of something. Yeah, so well, because like... they, they were all needed in Tunisia. You know, we only we had I think um, very short time. I think we had six weeks, Les and I, to get everything ready mm -hmm. for shooting. That mm -hmm. was it. And uh, the big skeleton in the Dune Sea. Well, that was a. Accident. John Barry had actually drawn a skeleton in one of his drawings. Mm -hmm. And we all said, that's a great idea. And I said, I, <laughs> I can't afford that. I'm not going to make one of those. The prop master in, in the studios came to me one day and said, listen, I'm clearing out. I've got to throw everything away in the attic because I need the space. So I'm mm -hmm. expanding. Go and have a look, boy. <laughs> and um, that I'll just go back. He was... Um, the huge property master did David Lean's films, all of these, mm -hmm. Frank. He was a wonderful man, one of the few really kind of responsible really for running an army and he yeah. helped to make this work. When my, he asked me, he called me boy. <laughs> we were so young, what do you want boy? And I said, strip the um, prop room out, leave it empty. I just need tools and I'm, I'm going to bring in scrap and we're mm -hmm. going to break it down and do the sets. I'm standing there next to him when this low loader backs in. It was yeah. a 16 wheeler with, there were Rolls Royce engines tied on it. There was mountains I bought so much. He didn't look <laughs> so much at me. garbage, basically. Was, yeah, yeah. He, look, he didn't look at me. I just heard, you know, you're mad boy. <laughs> <laughs> but then he said, okay, boy, in my office, five minutes, I've got the tea on. You tell me what you need. And that's how we did it. So, um, uh, it kind of somehow got made with Frank kind of behind everything. And I've lost my train of thought now from what your question was. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the skeleton. skeleton. Getting that so he him, said, yeah. go and look up in the attic. And yeah. I went in the attic and I found that full-size dinosaur yeah. from this previous movie. And I said, what are you going to do? He said, it's going in the junk. Mm. So I got it down. There's a photograph of it. We laid it out in the um, in the um, is in the, in the back lot? of the parking yeah. lot and we took it down and I put it in the desert and um, 
it, it gives a history to that planet that something's there. And I mean, yeah. we never realized it would turn into the Great Dragon and all of this whole yeah. history, like a lot of things we did. But at the end of it, then I said to Robert Watts, what should we do? And he said, leave it. I can't afford to take it home. We don't have the money to trek it back. Leave it. Well, some people eventually did go and, and, and bring some of it. Uh, well, it's in the documentaries. David West Reynolds, who became the head of literature at Lucasfilm, mm -hmm. he became that because he's an archaeologist. He's a Star Wars geek. Yeah. He thought all these sites should be there for preserved and mm -hmm. people could visit. And he asked Lucasfilm. They said, sorry, everything got thrown away. No one believed in this film. Everything yeah. got thrown out. Rick McCollum was pulling his hair out. We had to go back on Phantom Menace. Mm -hmm. So David, on his own money, got a little crew and went. Because he's an archaeologist, he had every clip of the film. He sourced by yeah. um, reference every shot we did, every angle, everything of every yeah. set. And that's when uh, Rick McCollum remembered his name and said, get that kid up here. I think he's got something. And he went down and showed them. So he, in the documentary I've done from the book, um, I've got David and all his footage and how he went and found it. And the hardest thing for him was that skeleton. Yeah, so I imagine, you know, as opposed to like um, some of the rocky terrain, like where, where R2 goes through, which is, easier to distinguish this is just all desert right yeah, it all looks kind of the same yeah and we we had to go in from the back we forbade because on film sets it's traditional you set everything up you get it all ready and then the crews come in they all start walking in and going <laughs> oh look at this and everything so we banned everybody ah uh, because you'd see all the preserve, footprints yeah right? we yeah. had to preserve that sand so yeah. um we they built it from the back mm -hmm. um and yeah, that's, I mean, there's a few bones in Rancho Obi Wan. Mm -hmm. um, and funny enough, David found the cantina door that we built. Yes, and it was being used as a door to hold the chickens in. <laughs> <laughs> so he got it cut up and got home. He, he, yeah, he was even then sweating because he had to pay a hundred dollars for it. <laughs> um, and then the domes, you know, we added the domes. Yeah. That was in the back as a fit, as a water trough for the goats <laughs> upside down. So everyone asked me about that, but I think you know these are very poor farmers. I think yeah. something we did is um, well, just like you, they found a use for everything, yeah. right? And uh, yeah, yeah, like us, it was the same. Mm -hmm. I found a use for everything I could find. Yeah, the Millennium Falcon. So you had to build um, a cockpit and then kind of the the back room with the chess table yeah. and. Uh, uh, where Luke does his lightsaber training, um, uh, and uh, that was that one of your favorite sets, or yeah, the the yeah. hold was my favorite, but uh, that was the first set we built was the cockpit. Okay, and again, because of lack of money, there's only two angles on it, looking out because mm -hmm. of the hyperspace and looking in. Yes, yeah. Um, they'd hired um, uh. One of the art, art directors from 2001, mm -hmm. Harry Lang, and I kept watching him, and he was doing it beautifully, like 2001. I kept going into it saying, "Harry, I'm going to mess this up. You know that, <laughs> don't you?" And he looked at me, <laughs> "What is this kid doing?" Yeah. And eventually, he said, oh, "I finished," and I said, "Good, okay." And I got old fighter pilot seats, and we stuck yeah. those in. We managed to make all the stuff working, and. Um, I interviewed his son um, for the documentary, and he said, funny enough, after that, Harry, he said, I was 16. Harry asked me to come with him with a wheelbarrow, and we went to a scrapyard in London <laughs> and were pulling out pieces like you did for yeah. sets after that on another film. Yeah. And you saw the opportunity. So, yeah, he, he kind of worked out that was Star Wars. Yeah. That's how it should be. And that set, and then the, the main one that tested my kind of resilience <laughs> to giving up was the whole area. Yeah. Because all Why? John Barry just built the walls and that was it. Okay. So I had to make this look like a ship. Yeah. And um, I started layering. I bought um, PVC drain pipes and you could get it from quarter of an inch up to two foot, three foot sewer pipes. Okay. I had a whole stack of it. Yeah. It was cheap. 
That was going in. We found a telephone exchange that was being modernized. My buyer uh, bought the lot. That, that, he bought everything, yeah. and I was sticking those cables in. Mm -hmm. It just looked terrible. <laughs> and I, I was encouraging my prop gang to keep going, and we kept going and kept going. And I yeah. was praying no one would come on the set and look. <laughs> but the moment we kind of got it finally in, and, and I put on some oil drips, and uh, mm -hmm. we put in old aging and stuff suddenly everyone was coming on the set and i could tell then we'd won because yeah. they were kind of thinking how did you make this ship this is real you know mm -hmm. and i realized then that it this silly idea i'd had driving <laughs> around london yeah. actually had worked did uh were you there when george saw it yeah for the first time no or? i showed him i had to yeah. show him they asked me to take him down and show him the cockpit and then how what was his he yeah. just smiled i mean <laughs> i knew then that's it george and, and that's anything. a big reaction for, yeah. for george and yeah. that the only thing then i said was look i i like to personalize things and i think this is he's a gambler hand he has all this stuff i think we should hang some dice in there because yeah being in America, everyone had dice hanging in their cars. Uh, yeah, the fuzzy and, dice. Um, George said, oh, that's a good idea. And I said, it'll be good luck. It was good luck for you on, on graffiti because yeah. it was in Ron Howard's car they were hanging. Yeah. Um, and I got six pairs, chose the little, he chose the little tiny silver ones. Mm -hmm. They went in. They're in one or two shots on Star Wars and the DP got fed up with them and pulled them out and they never went back. <laughs> but we all remember them as as being there all the time, yeah. I think, really. Some, I was on a um, Ask Me Anything Reddit and talking about this and somebody said, have you just seen the Rat Vanity Fair cover? And mm -hmm. There they are Yeah, for Phantom Menace. For, uh, for um, uh, sorry, The Force for, Awakens? For Force Awakens. Yeah. There they are. Yeah. And apparently AJ, AJ is pretty detail-oriented, mm -hmm. JJ, and he'd gone out and had them source same ones that oh. he found, Yeah, put them in. That mm -hmm. scene got cut out. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> well, it, but it, they came back with, it's such an emotional moment when yeah. uh, uh, Leia gives it to Luke. Yes, yeah. Well, and with all the new content that, that's out there that's reusing <clears throat> the stuff you made in like you know so much more stuff has been done on the millennium falcon since you first created it what's it like to uh, to see i guess other people's work of your work i just god bless dave filoni every day <laughs> i think this man has brought back everything that was star wars from everything that was in for the mandalorian and he's detail obsessed and mm -hmm has revived that world again because it it was it's always there i think we it's kind of set the standards for science fiction that yes. you had to believe it now mm -hmm. um but you know but do you this, like look at the millennium falcon cockpit of the force awakens or something and be like yeah that button shouldn't be there <laughs> or like uh, that, that part needs to be a bit bigger or <laughs> well it does say in the script <laughs> luke says this is a pile of junk yes yeah <laughs> so, yeah <laughs> <laughs> I was following the script, but no, I, I kind of look at, you know, it's, yeah, I've always loved and I support this world because I think George single-handedly has given the world something to believe in mm -hmm. globally. Every, mm -hmm. doesn't matter what country or religion or anything. Yeah. May, religions aren't engrossing the young so much. He's mm -hmm. given the planet something to believe in because he created a myth mm -hmm. and it's exactly the right it's good defeats evil and it's yeah. fun and it's um and i just support it all the time because i think we need it especially now the world in the way it is mm -hmm. but yeah. i you know i i did like what jj did on on his two <laughs> we didn't none of us like the other one <laughs> i don't want to say about it but um i just thought he went against everything that george had ever kind of very carefully had considered mm -hmm. in mythology and the whole thing and the stories George had mapped them all out whether he was making it up as he went along but those six episodes mm -hmm. are all mapped out yeah did George like drop hints to you about 
the rest of the story, like as you were working on yeah, but on funny Star enough, Wars? yeah, but his his idea, he told me he wanted to do nine. Mm -hmm. What he wanted to do was a three before, way before Star Wars, kind of much more of a um, of a, a kind of samurai type movie. Yeah, it would go way way go, back. go way back. Yeah, to the origins. Yeah, but if you look at Return of the Jedi. Mm -hmm. It's really, um, I always point this out, that, that it leads to the point where the son and the father, who hate each other and want to kill each other, finally get to that moment. Yeah. And like an animal kingdom, the young one gets the older one down. Yeah. And he switches off the lightsaber. He doesn't kill him. And um, Darth Vader removes, asks him to remove his helmet. And mm -hmm. you know he's going to die because he can't breathe. Yeah. And all that's left is... George's kind of Buddhism, if you like, which is compassion and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. That's the end, really, of that six, when you look at it as a fitting end. Yes, well, it's uh, the final battle, in a sense, is is about one guy who, who won't fight. Yeah. Right, and that's yeah. the final fight, is, yeah. is not the not yeah, fighting. Yeah, which is the truth of the Jedis, and it comes from like the Shaolin monks who've trained. They're not mm -hmm. trained to fight, they're trained to defend. Yes. They happen to be able to fight better than anyone else. <laughs> yes. <but. laughs> um, that brings up, we haven't touched on lightsabers. Oh, lightsaber, yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so where where in the timeline or in the process did, uh, well, did Luke's lightsaber first get me? I couldn't make anything in the studio so it was junk i, I collected any yeah. junk then my buyers were bringing skip loads of old there were no computers then but there were calculators and things yeah. and i was finding everything i could not find anything that i felt would justify a weapon of the jedi because you must have like a picture in your head of what this well the the was. only ralph Macquarie painting is yeah. in fact the stormtroopers originally yes, had lightsabers yeah. but theirs were like lances that the medieval knights used. If you, there's a wonderful Macquarie yeah. painting. Yeah, and it's kind of pointier on the yeah. end. Yeah, that's the only reference. Mm -hmm. My reference came because I grew up with myth and legend, got me through childhood and King Arthur, and I, yeah. you know, I played Excalibur. I was fighting all the time with it, so yeah. I knew this was that iconic kind of would be the icon of Star Wars if it ever worked. Yeah, I hadn't found anything, and they were pressuring me because it was needed to hang on his belt. Well, that's a pretty Tunisia. important piece. <laughs> um, and I, I had to make Luke's binoculars, mm -hmm. which is the only drawing I ever did ever was trying to work out what they would look like, and I did drawings of those. Mm -hmm. And... I found three different camera parts and stuck them together with super glue. And, and then yeah. I thought, you know what? I need to let the audience know this is binoculars. Yeah, to be so familiar, I, but not familiar. So at the I same went time. to the gun, uh, to there's a camera hire shop in London that mm -hmm. we got everything, Brunnings from everything. Yeah. And so I went to buy those lenses. And I happened to be with the manager and I said, have you got anything? I have to make this kind of sword and everything. And he said, yeah. well, have a look under that shelf there there's some old boxes i don't know what's yeah. in them yeah and it was literally i pulled out this box and the music rises now and, <laughs> yeah. and it goes into slow motion yeah i bet it's the, and there was the three perfect thing right? handles yeah. for the, the power packs for yeah. the um for, for the, the graflex camera yeah because yeah. they were the cameras used by um the um paparazzi in the 40s okay and so he had a lot of those mm-hmm um and i just went oh i found it and i just loved you know and there's something about something designed for something else that you don't quite know what it is but it had mm -hmm. a firing button it had yeah i ran to the office i i had some t-strip left over from i stuck around the um storm from the stormtrooper oh yeah stuck seven of those around i happened to be breaking down a um a texas instrument i remember it calculator and the bubble strip that illuminated the numbers and, mm -hmm. and magnified them, it fitted perfectly because I didn't like the grip. Yeah. And um, I called George over and said, you better come and have a look. I think I found it. So once you brought that back, was it like within a matter of hours you had yeah. kind of your finished product? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Straight away, I just yeah. stuck it with Supergirl. I just finished it and called George over. And then he just wanted the clip on the end because it was to hang to on his on belt. belt. Um, 
and that was it. I made three because I had an idea because no one knew how to do the blade. Yeah. Um, and I I experimented at art school, kind of, we were doing stuff for exhibitions, painting front projection paint on things that picked up night. Okay. So I suggested we put a rod in and paint it, the DP. Yeah. Ah, that won't work and dismissed it. George said, try it. Yeah. And we did, and it worked. It picked up light. Mm -hmm. And the other decision we'd all made on Star Wars was the blades should act like swords. They shouldn't go through each other. Yeah. So they never do that yeah. in the entire Star Wars canon. Mm -hmm. So the sticks, when Obi-Wan and um, when, well, with Ralph and, um, uh, with, uh, sorry, Dave Prowse and um, yeah. Alec Guinness, yeah. they could hit each other. They were breaking them all the time because <laughs> really? they were just yeah, thin sticks, but it kind of worked. Yeah. Um, and well, that, they gave them something rather than, yeah. than faking it. Yeah. Kind of, they could. And I interviewed David French. So I, I got all these people before they pass away because this is Star Wars history. And as yeah. David West Reynolds said, I'm the only one who knows all these stories. Unfortunately, I had to write this book that <laughs> kind of almost forced me because... You know, even my son now, they see these huge Hollywood movies, but it yeah. came from a ragtag group of people with no money and a bit <laughs> of a belief in something. And um, it's become that important that it, it had to be put down for history. Yeah. So I interviewed him and then we talked about it. And then we said, how many of the graphics handles went to the studio? How many did we buy? And he said, 33. You had 33. <laughs> yeah. And then... I had David Whiteley, this um, English producer, interview him because we were stuck here with COVID. I couldn't mm -hmm. go. And um, he said, oh, um, I, they paid £850 <laughs> for 33. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine yeah. now? <laughs> yeah, imagine now what those ones, uh, those would be worth. Yeah. Wow. So That's... that was the lightsaber. Wow. So. And yeah. then we made Alec Guinness's one for um because his was the first one that you see come out and light up and be used. Yeah. In the cantina. That was a piece of a Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. Okay. And a piece of a grenade. It was a special grenade that could launch. Okay. So the main two components, if you look at it, that's a grenade and a and a piece of a Rolls-Royce Merlin oh, engine wow. stuck together. <laughs> <laughs> And the only one we that we was properly made, and we got the special effects to do was Darth Vader's, which has a different end on it. Okay, so that one was more less made from scrap well, that, and was, more yeah, manufactured. That, it was kind of my idea that you have. They had such sophisticated weapons and yeah. the Death Star, and that, that's why the Tuscan Raiders. I gave them old kind of guns and, yeah. and a gaffy stick to hit people with. Yeah, um, and so we thought. His weapon should be a little bit more kind of industrial revolution kind of uh, yeah. technical style. Yeah. Okay. And uh, I guess Gaffy Stick, that's one other well, that, of the weapons, <laughs> eh? That, uh... I found that and I thought, yeah. wow, this is perfect. And then I had to change anything, everything I had to change a bit. I didn't yeah. want to use it. So I found an old medieval mace that they manufactured, yeah. stuck that in the end. That's the only one we had. They made a mock-up second one, but that one's in the kind of fight. But mm -hmm. again, you know, I was like amazed in Boba Fett. To see it come back to and to be like such a, a prominent part and, of And it. have the history and how he made it and yeah. everything, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so it's cool, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think I could talk to you for like six hours <laughs> sitting here about everything. I have but, done uh, that. <laughs> um, <laughs> let, let's skip ahead a bit so that we we get uh, we get through all of it. But then, when when did you see Star Wars? I um, I went from the set onto the final remake of Beaujest. It was a Marty Feldman film in Spain that was mm -hmm. just nonstop. Star Wars, I didn't have a day off in, in yeah. a year, no Sundays, nothing. And then that was the same. And then I went back, we did Alien. Mm -hmm. um, and in between that, there was a crew screening in London. Okay. At the, um, it was a Tottenham Court Road, beautiful cinema. And I remember going in there and 
it's the same experience as they said before that all of these naysayers, the crew, nobody knew. The moment that mm -hmm. ship came overhead, the whole yeah. cinema went into a buzz. You could feel yeah. it. Um, and even for people who had worked on it and kind of knew a bit of what was coming, it was still Nobody did. They, they, crazy. Uh, Les Dilly, who's you know, a dear, dear friend of mine, I worked on several films. He was interviewed. He said, we thought it was a pile of rubbish, this old junk. No one's ever going to see this film. Yeah. Nobody believed it. Hmm. Um, and I think... Everybody kind of understood finally what George had done what he had in his head somehow well. and got and pulled it off. Well, what do you think is what's George Lucas's like superpower or special skill that that you know only he could have made that movie or something? What what does well, he bring to the table? Several table? things. One is um, Joseph Campbell. Mm -hmm. And Joseph Campbell is the great mythologist. And if you read Hero with a Thousand Faces, the, the book explains there are one basic story. Yes. There's yeah. a thousand ways. I call it a billion ways now to tell it. Yeah. He mentored George into how to tell a myth and how Star Wars actually has keys buried in it. Certain moments, Luke with the twin sons, that the, mm -hmm. aren't dying, the defeat of the father, the various different stages, those are all buried in there. Yeah. And George already had studied mythology, so he he followed his teaching. Mm -hmm. And then um, I think George's unique ability, he hired everybody. It wasn't just me. Everybody he hired, even to the poster designers, were people who were young, mm -hmm. who'd done a bit of the job. Yeah weren't going to go to him and say, no, Gov, that's not how we do it. We do it like this. This works. This wouldn't work. And because he was young himself, right? Yeah, we time, were like, like students, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, and I think, look at it. Um, Joe Johnson was a surfer. He just <laughs> applied for a job. He didn't even know <laughs> that, that he was needed to draw anything. And um, Richard Edland was doing army photography and various other things. That's yeah. what they were doing. Um, yeah. You know, our costume designer had never designed before. He was the wardrobe master on Gandhi and films like that. He yeah. could equip an army, but he was always in my office plundering props and <laughs> with John Barry getting advice on what science fiction could be. Yeah. So I think, and it's right across the board when you look at it with George, he always hired people who... Mm -hmm. And he says it himself. He wrote things that couldn't be done, but he hired people who'd figure it out how to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it sounds too like you always felt like he had your back. That yeah, that you could go out and and, and make something and not worry about checking in or or yeah. uh, his reaction to you, but just go with what you thought was right. It's the kind of power of the universe that somehow him and my brain had the same idea and yeah. John Barry too and and it connected by chance universal chance yeah. into one moment and he honestly on Star Wars he never ever declined anything I ever did I showed him sets in Tunisia props everything we did he it was there's one other story that I left the little um communicator because it was going to be used later on by C three PO in the um, oh in the in the Gar yeah, yeah the Death Star yeah. in, the, in the Garburator I call it, <laughs> um, and I was with John Barry's office and he was trying to design something and I had some plumbing bits so I took in some U bends from under the sink yeah. And the phone rang while I was undoing a piece of the thing, and uh, John said he's decided he needs the um, communicator now on set. As a filter dropped into my hand, literally from this piece, and I went, "Oh, there it is!" <laughs> St stuck one thing round, took it down. George took it, went, "Yep," and it went straight into a stormtrooper's hand. And it's now one of the holy grails of Star Wars because no one's ever found it. <laughs> so you're just grabbing random pieces around you, basically, yeah. and bringing them up. I think it's just instinct. I, I kind of, it, it, I embrace this world, and it, yeah. to me, it was. It was the best job I ever had. Yeah, and your brain was always going, yeah. looking for things yeah. and thinking. Yeah, and I understood it. I read next. a lot of science fiction yeah. books and stuff, so Tolkien, everybody. So yeah. I kind of, that world was inherent in me. Mm -hmm. 
Cool. Well, I want to leave some time for questions and I know we're, we're getting late, but I do want to touch on um, the Phantom Menace again, because that you returned to Star Wars in the Phantom Menace. Uh, how did you get tapped to work as a well, second unit director on that? I was, I, I, after Life of Brian, after Alien, I thought, you know what, I've got to start directing now. So I, I went to film school, wrote Black Angel, and it was pure chance that it, George was fed up with this short film because then there was no ads in cinema. There was a 25-minute short mm -hmm. and, the, and the main feature. Okay. That's all there was. Yeah, He was so fed up with the short film that Fox had put with Star Wars, that he said, we can make one yeah, because the British government had a grant of 25,000 pounds. So I wrote this medieval kind of epic of my own mm -hmm. and I didn't know, but it got sent to George and he said, that's it. This will go out. Tell him the government, I'm going to put it out with Empire Strikes Back. Mm -hmm. So that I got to make. And while I was waiting for a feature film money, George was doing Return of the Jedi, mm -hmm. then called Revenge of the Jedi. Yeah. And um, he, George's least favorite film of all the Star Wars six is Empire Strikes Back. Really? Which a lot of fans love, it's but it's an favorite. adult film. Yes. Yeah. Star Wars is aimed at nine to 12 year olds. Yeah. That's George's audience. And he wanted Return of the Jedi back into that arena. Yeah. So he decided he was doing second unit. Yeah he decided he would go with the main unit all the time. So they called me and asked me if I would go and take over. So I did <laughs> Return of the Jedi. And I I mean, I got to shoot Harrison Ford coming out of the carbon because um, mm -hmm. <laughs> they couldn't schedule him in. I did loads of stuff on it that was really cool. Yeah. So we'd established, I was off, I was doing a film in Vancouver. I went down to San Francisco and um, I was doing a sound mix down there and they said, come and meet Rick McCullum. Mm -hmm. George wants to say hello. So I went, met them all. George, it was then he looked at Rick and said, you know, there were only five people stood with me on Star Wars and Roger was one of them. And, yeah. um, and did you even know he was working on a new Star Wars? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it, yeah. They then said, why didn't you come and see us in Leavesden? And I said, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, like you do, you know, nothing <laughs> more of it. I went. Um, and I realized why I went, they said, go meet the designer. He was in a panic. He said, how, I don't know how to deal with George. Well, I, how do I? <laughs> and I said, because he doesn't say anything. He said, no, he doesn't say anything. I said, no, he's not going to tell you how to do it. Do it and show him. If he likes it, he'll smile. If he doesn't, <laughs> he'll tell you. Yeah. And he'll change it. And that's how he works. It's his, George's genius again. Mm hmm I did the same with the set deck, everybody. And then the DP was a friend of mine who I'd started in, in, in doing commercials. He said, why aren't you doing second unit, Roger? We're shooting this film in 12 weeks. It's a 24-week <laughs> schedule. Mm -hmm. So I went in the office and I, I said to ask Rick McCallum, I said, is anyone doing second unit? No, no. He said, we don't need second unit. George mm -hmm. can do it. We'll catch up afterwards. And he said, Ben Burt's going to come over and do a few shots. Yeah. So I said, just put my name down. <laughs> Um, and I got the call. <laughs> Would you come, please? Yeah. Sit down with us. And they talked about second units. And I told George how I did it to get my second units. Because most second unit directors want to get a job. So they're trying to please a producer, not the director. So they're trying to put their, so they're putting their, their flavor it. into it. I worked out how to get exactly what I needed with mm -hmm. a small, a, a, just a small portable camera and, and a little clamshell viewer okay george just said buy those right now and get those and then yeah. they finally said well are you serious can you do the second unit and yeah. i said yeah i'd love to and um they said well can you start immediately and i said well i've just got to go and do sound and they said we're leaving the office now you've got five minutes you decide <laughs> and you start right now or yeah. you can't do it <laughs> And I made a phone call and then I understood when I said, I'll do it because they took me into a room and there was yeah. my office. There was an assistant <laughs> already there. And um, they were pretty confident your answer was going to yeah. be yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, they knew I wouldn't turn it down. <laughs> and um, the thing what I understood then, they, they trained the two crews that they used on Young Indy. They, they okay. leapfrogged each episode. Yes, yeah. So they were highly trained over years. Yeah. 
I had the other crew, and then they explained why I needed to do it because we were going to be first unit on six different scenes that we had to go in first and set yeah. the lighting, everything. Okay. And the first thing was the um, the Senate with all the pods. Yep. So I had to go and shoot all of that. Yeah. With Terence Stamp and um, mm -hmm. and I have to say, everyone says, "Oh, wasn't it changed now? It's like a huge film and everything," but. Uh, George put up his own money for it. Yeah. And the budget was $110 million. Rick McCullum put it to all the studios a script and said, I need a budget for this to do it there in Hollywood. Each yeah. one came back over $400 million. So kind of the same story. It again, was made right? the same like, story. Yeah. But they laughed because, because of me buying scrap, <laughs> which was cheap. No one yeah. wanted it. And then I did the same on Alien, yeah. even more there to do the whole Nostromo. It had started an industry. Now you could only, <laughs> then on Phantom, you could only rent it, hugely expensive. Yeah. It was cheaper for Rick to fly airplane parts from the Texas graveyards yeah. in a huge transport plane to Tunisia and oh, London. Wow. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> you know, it. I got a lot, of uh, the Darth Maul you and McGregor fight to shoot. I mean, mm -hmm. I just can you imagine? I mean, it's, yeah, the, it's the like ultimate battle. Yeah, and it, and it's just you know you're kicking yourself and you and McGregor and I can't say exactly what he says because every swear word my son gets five dollars. <laughs> um, <laughs> But you and McGregor, I, I can fund you a little bit if you need. I can. You and McGregor give you a kept couple walking bucks. around the stage, going, "I'm in effing Star Wars. <laughs> I'm in effing Star Wars," and I was feeling the same. Like I was directing it. We got to we got to film, and I told my unit, "Today you have to understand something in the Star Wars history. This is very important." And mm -hmm. George never liked dealing with R two D two. Yeah, because <laughs> he said, "You deal with him. You've got more patience." And. Um, we got to shoot when R2-D2 and C-3PO meet for the first time. Yeah. He's got no clothes yeah, well, on. Yeah, he doesn't have the, the outer and, thing on yeah. And um, R2-D2 <laughs> beeps at him and he says, what do you mean naked? Yeah. Carrie Fisher wrote that line, by uh, the way. Um, <clears throat> and we, I got to film so much stuff, the pod race. I mean, and then George asked me what I was doing at the end. He had to go back for ILM. The pressure was so bad. Oh, really? Yeah. So I finished the movie. I did the last five to 10 days of shooting. Okay. I wrapped yeah. Liam. I wrapped a lot of the actors mm -hmm. on the last days. Um, yeah, I mean, I just, it, it's like, you know, you're a kid in a candy box, really. Yeah. Yeah. You <laughs> spent a lot of years in that universe, eh? Yeah. All right. Well, before we go to questions, I want to, uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, your book and about the uh, documentary so, as well? Um, if you look at all the official makings of, yeah, they're on Disney Plus now, John yeah. Barry and I never mentioned. <laughs> yeah. And the, how this universe was created, because George was so consumed trying to pull this thing through that he didn't know. He just yeah. knows what we brought and everything. And then... If, when Phantom Menace in July, there was always a picnic at the ranch mm -hmm. right from before it was built. It yeah. was tradition. Okay. I was there. This young kid came running down to me and said, Roger, you're Roger Christian. I need to ask you questions. And this was David West Reynolds. Yeah. So I was answering questions nonstop. And he said, you've got to write this book. There's no one... You're the only one. John Barry's died. The, yeah. the other art directors had no clue. They were just lieutenants getting things made. Yeah. So um, he kind of almost forced me to take a year <laughs> off and write everything down. And I remember everything. I have a, I've always kept fairly healthy and uh, eaten carefully and <laughs> properly. And my memory is pretty much intact. So yeah. it all came tumbling out. <laughs> I got Lucasfilm's permission I couldn't do it through Lucasfilm um, because they were deeply worried at the time. And David was put in charge of publicity for Phantom Menace. Yeah. And they were saying that George hadn't directed for 20 something years and they thought they might have lost the audience. Um, and Rick McCallum said that to me, if as long as we can cover our costs, that's all we're looking at. We're, really? we're very worried about it. Wow. They didn't want to look back. Yeah. They wanted to look forward yeah. and they were trying to rebrand George because he was so shy. He's, you you never yeah. read anything about George. Um, yeah, or see interviews with no, him really. very rarely. Yeah. So 
I said, well, I, I really should do Alien as well because no one's ever written anything then about Alien. Yeah. Nothing had come out. So I thought, well, we'll do that. And I did the making of Black Angel, how I made that with a crew of nine and yeah. tried to be Kurosawa. <laughs> and um, <laughs> so it's, it's, yeah, it got published. Um, and it's called? It's still going. That's Cinema. called Cinema Alchemist. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you know alchemy, but. Well, in, not in, super well, but yeah. <laughs> well, in ancient times, yeah. they tried to turn base metal into gold. Into gold so yeah. I used scrap metal and I got an Oscar. So I turned <laughs> the scrap metal go, into yeah. gold. That's why I call it alchemist. <laughs> um, but um, <clears throat> I've since, during COVID, made a proper documentary, again, like Star Wars. We were stuck, an editor and I, for a year. They gave me a room in, in the post house. We yeah. couldn't travel. Yeah. I found an interactive um, studio in Toronto that made children's films, and I was able to link in London, LA, and different mm -hmm. places, and we could put them in with me at the same time, and we could be live. Yeah. Um, Guillermo del Toro, who became a director because of Star Wars, mm -hmm. said he wanted to be a part of it. Yeah. And because uh, of COVID, and I say, well, how are we going to do this? He said, oh, just meet me outside the Netflix stage at nine o'clock in the morning with one camera. And that's all I had. Yeah. He held the mic. I held the mic yeah. when we were doing our interviews. He gave a, he's very erudite mm -hmm. and very um, deeply kind of passionate and intelligent yeah. about, so he gives a really great through line on it. Yeah. Oops, sorry. And... Um, Gareth Edwards, to me, Rogue One is an ideal Star Wars movie. I think of all of them, it's the closest to yeah, what I we mean, did. When you talk about that lived-in feel yeah. and that that vibe, right? Like, so he really nails it. Yeah. So he's interviewed right throughout it. He gives an incredible yeah. take on how everything was done for the world. Um, I had Carl Newman who made Fanboys. He's mm -hmm. he's, he's interviewed a, yeah. a lot. And then I just went through everything. Bill Harmon, before he died, the, um, the old carpenter, he's yeah. very I funny. On, yeah. He's really funny. He's still <laughs> here, but uh, he kept going. Um, <laughs> David French in London. I got all these people involved. Uh, Paul Bateman became a huge friend of Ralph McQuarrie. Mm -hmm. And Paul... Ralph Macquarie is so shy. He's very sweet. All right. and only drew. That's all he did. Paul yeah. said if, if he had a bus ticket, he'd draw on it. <laughs> and uh, his website was absolute rubbish. So Paul did it for him. He finally yeah. convinced him, did all of that for him. He then went around all the events in America and everywhere. He sells Ralph's yeah. work, but he makes sure it's... I've, I've purchased, I believe, <laughs> from him so then, I imagine. He yeah. always made sure everything was correctly done as Ralph yeah. did. So he knows all the Ralph stories. And again, Ralph, Ralph got the job and um, he was down in LA and it was John Barry who persuaded them that we couldn't afford to make the Millennium Falcon or the hold and the hangar it went in, and we could do half of it and do a map painting. So yeah. he explained to Ralph how to do a map painting. Oh, wow. Ralph read about it and said, oh, you do them on glass. So he took his shower door off, painted <laughs> the first map painting on the shower door, oh, wow. and then he had to get it to San Francisco. He tied it on the top of his old car and drove <laughs> all the way up to San Francisco. And then he had to find a new shower. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, shower door. Yeah. <laughs> but um, he, he was the shyest, most really? kind of... Um, humble person you could ever meet, but he's a genius. And I really yeah. wanted in the documentary to give him back to the world the value of. Um, and I think um, Gareth Edwards said, you know, if you if you look at the team on Star Wars, if you took one person out, yeah, the difference it would make. If you yeah. took Ralph out of that equation, mm -hmm. it would never be the same film. Yeah, um, and I think he deserves his huge place in the history of this yeah. whole. And I know Doug Chang very well now, and I, yeah. I had to go and talk to them and tell them how we did things. And Doug, to this day, even doing Mandalorian and the others, um, if he gets stuck, he goes and looks through the files, and he said, Ralph's already designed it. It's yeah. already there. Yeah. And in fact, in Mandalorian, 
the the um, the cantina that Ralph painted mm-hmm. based on um, Rick's Cafe oh, yeah. in um, Casablanca mm-hmm. didn't work because of the way the two robots had to come and then get told they couldn't come yeah. and then he was in a booth. So John Barry redesigned it. But that original design, I yeah. notice, is in Mandalorian. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's probably something we didn't notice. <laughs> yeah. And that's uh, a galaxy built on hope. A galaxy right? built on hope. Which and- I, it, it was a two hour 20 fan special yeah. um, on Blu-ray. They've pulled it at the moment because I broke it into six half-hour episodes okay. and they're trying to sell it. So, But okay, I'm trying great. to so get my hands hopefully on... Hopefully streaming somewhere soon. I hope, yeah. yeah. You never know. It's so hard nowadays to get anything anywhere. But um, it kind of belongs on Disney Plus, yeah. really. Yeah. But we'll see. We're, they're trying to sell it. Okay, but great. I'm trying to get back all the ones on Amazon that didn't get sold. I'm trying to get those copies so that we could sell okay. some. Because you've seen it, yep. We we had a few copies we sold. Yeah, uh, why well, I, I borrowed Chris's copy? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so that I could watch it. So uh, yeah, we can share it around a bit. Yeah. Um. So why don't we? I'm going to open the floor to uh, to questions. <laughs> Obviously, we could go on for like five more hours on this, but uh, we need to eat dinner and do other stuff. But <laughs> go ahead. Uh, Roger, when when they're making the new stuff, and because all the new creators have such an eye for Easter eggs and details. I'll give an example. Uh, in Mandalorian, when they used the rod piece that was from the trash compactor to hold things open, Yep. do they A, ever hit you up and be like, where'd you get this? Or how? Or maybe where did you find this? And B, do you notice it right away? Like with that, when they Yeah, I did that notice that one. Did you notice yeah, that? no, I said it. There's that because... <laughs> <laughs> because it was one of my nightmares <laughs> because I took two pieces of drain pipe and I tried to link it together and I couldn't keep it straight. It was, a, and God bless Harrison Ford because I used to go and say, Harrison, I need your help here. I cannot make this work. And he said, don't worry, Roger, in his way. And he made it work. He did the same with the um, going into hyperspace. That I couldn't make that work. He made that work for me. I saw that straight away. Um, and... Doug Chang did. Doug Chang. They had me go and they filmed me for two hours at the ranch going through everything that I did. Um, And he kept saying, JJ, you should be the advisor on this. But I think Kathleen Kennedy blocked it, any of us going for some reason of her own. Um, And I know that um, they had all of our original stuff that they could find, they got onto the set with JJ and he was always referencing it. But they never asked, no. The new shows, like all the Flowyverse, they they never hit you up? No. (laughs) (laughs) They should. Uh, Any other questions? Anyone? The one big one actually was was the, um, was the lightsaber for me. Because on Empire Strikes Back, Um, because John Barry had died um, and I was, I made the short film to go with it. So I wasn't on it. I was on the set a few times, but the designer was the art director on the, on the new hope, the set deck who I knew who was much better at, Oh, I keep doing this. He was much better at period films and stuff for some reason. In the T-strip, if you look, he put rivets to hold the T-strip in, which I would never have done. It, it's, to me, this is a mystical weapon of the Jedi's, and that made it human. Mm-hmm. Sadly, that went right the way through on every Star Wars movie from then on. That's the, the standard one. But um, I think it's on Boba Fett when they, he has to get the lightsaber and he buries it. And Dave Filoni put my original one in there. Uh-huh. He didn't use the one with rivers. So that's why I was going, Dave, Dave, I, I'm going to go and meet him one day and <laughs> kiss his feet. <laughs> I just imagine your reaction as you were watching that on the couch. Yeah. I saw, yeah. saw that. Okay, here. Um, one thing that I think is brilliant about R2-D2 is that the number that George chose for R2 is an infantile number. It's the number two. He also looks, you've designed him to look, he makes noises rather than fully constituted words, almost like a child. And he, he crawls around, sort of. 
like a kid who doesn't learn the walk yet. I noticed that the style of how you created R2D2 also looks a bit infantile, with the round head and the round eye. Um, I was wondering how much did you make those decisions consciously? How much of it was just subconscious? We're on instinct. You just felt this feels like the right kind of head. And now if it's analyzed by total analysts 30 years later, 40 years later, they, they can see what how brilliant your thinking was. Were you doing that consciously or was it just on feel? It was on feel. It, it's kind of my subconscious instinct that um, that somehow I identified with this world. Um, and I think it's from reading science fiction and, and growing up um, with, you know, things like King Arthur. I mean, all of these are ancient stuff. Tolkien, everything has got that kind of use feel about it. But um, all of this was instinctual. Um, I, you know, I, I didn't even have a preconceived idea of the lightsaber. I knew it was a handle, but it was only when I saw that graphics that I went, there it is. Um, I think, you know, it, th that went for everything that we made, all the weapons, everything. It, there was a genuine kind of regard for, as I was saying earlier, the Death Star should be cold and engineered and there's no love in that world. And the Tuscan Raiders were rough kind of desert people, so I gave them weapons to suit that. It was all consciously thought out very carefully for characters. Each, each thing that I did would suit the character and suit the film. Um, and I think that it's all subconscious, you know, and that's how myths operate and they do penetrate your subconscious. And I think that's part of the reason that Star Wars penetrated to the world was because it was a kind of world that everybody understood and, and it was a, comfortable with when they saw it instead when you watch sci-fi you know plastic guns going beep and i don't know why but uh, old science fiction films always had indian collars nero collars mm -hmm. for science fiction oh that would be the future you know <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so true yeah. all right well thank you thank you so much uh, thank you for coming yeah. everybody thank you for all your work on star wars <laughs> and thank you so much for coming here